question is by Paul Hackensel. How to cross the void. Yep. Thanks, Sarah. Okay. So today I want to talk about a question which will seem similar to one that I've sort of talked about before, but with an important twist. So the question is, what are the GL2R orbit closures in hyperlithic components of strata? So these two in particular. So this is the question that we'll discuss. And so the answer, which I will just write down right now, is the following. All orbits are one of the following. They're closed, they're dense, or they're contained in a locus of branch hours. So I don't want to define what it means to be contained in a locus of branch covers any more than to just give a picture right now. So this is what some translation service contained in a locus of branch covers looks like. So if we have some sort of Riemann surface with a holomorphic one form, just drawn, and it contains a map down to a lower genus Riemann surface so that the flat structure is given by pulling back the flat structure downstairs back to our original Riemann surface, then we'll say that you're contained in a locus of Riemann surface. So writing that out takes too many sentences, but this picture contains all the information that I want to understand. Is that the same thing as imprinted? Uh, yes, I think, well, we sort of. The answer, morally speaking, should be yes. Whether or not you want this to cover a quadratic differential is sort of what might account for that difference. I want this to be uh, a pullback of an abelian differential downstairs. All right, so the answer is yes. And so like I said, when I introduced this topic, you might look at this and say, wow, this looks very similar to a talk that I've heard before. What's new here? And so the new information, for Mark, what's new? The new result is for orbit closures of dimension three. Okay? So now, this result might have looked great at first, but now you say, okay, the only new content is for just this one particular case here. Why on earth should we care? And the reason why you should care is because the techniques that allow for a classification of orbit closures in this sort of small dimension don't really need facts about height, or rather they don't need so many facts about height. And so there's a hope that, in general, you could take the argument that I'm about to outline, which is incredibly simple, and transfer it to other strata to study orbit closures of low dimension. And then once you do that, inductive arguments might give you facts about higher dimensional orbit closures. So what I hope to do in this talk is to present a result which is about low dimension orbit closures, and sort of motion at why this might lead to a more general story about studying orbit closures and other strata, not just him. Okay. So that's the plan. All right. So first, I want to explain what's difficult about this result for dimension three, and why this dimension three result wasn't included with this result for higher dimension. So I'm going to give you just a very quick sketch of how this proof goes when the dimension of my orbit closure, which I'll always denote by the script m, is bigger than 3. Okay, so here is a very high level proof of this result. So, wait, wait a minute, Paul. Yeah. John and I are wondering what about eigenform loci in these. Ah, thank you. Yeah, sorry. There is fine print. Here's the fine print. G is bigger than 2. Thanks. <laughs> yep. Uh, I even wrote a note to myself in my notes, which said, <laughs> remember to say this, because I kept forgetting when I practiced the talk. Uh, in genus 2, Kurt McMullen classified what these orbit closures are, so we have a complete solution there. This applies for genus bigger than 2. Thanks. OK. Right, so what's the sketch when you have your dimension bigger <laughs> than 3? Uh, so first, by Smiley Weiss, you studied horse cycle flow. We 
can find, let's say, a horizontally periodic translation surface in our orbit closure. And now here's the big idea. Here's how you build a branch cover when you have lots of dimension. So here's the big idea, which is that cylinder parallelism builds abbreviated BC branch covers. Okay? So what does that mean? What does this sort of like, I don't know, almost Cohen of an idea mean? Well, so here is an example of some sort of branch cover. What does BC stand for? Branch cover. Branch cover. Yep. So here is uh, an example of some sort of branch cover. And now if I consider the locus of all surfaces, which are covers of things in H2, here's something I might do in H2. I might give the surface a tiny kink, like that. Now what happens over here? Well, my surface here gets a tiny kink. Like this. And so what's happened? Well, I have this shaded cylinder here. And the pre-images of the shaded cylinders are still parallel. They're both pointing in the horizontal direction. But this second cylinder here, this one I'm drawing unshaded, has now gone off parallel. And so we see, coming back to my horizontally periodic translation surface, that I should consider these cylinders as existing in equivalence classes. One, the shaded kinds, which are always going to be parallel to each other, and then two unshaded, which are also all going to be parallel to each other. And then how do I build this branch cover? Well, what I do is I find some way of sending my shaded cylinders to one cylinder and my unshaded to another. But so the high level idea, the big idea for why this is true in dimension bigger than three, is that cylinder parallelism builds a branch cover, basically by this picture here. So then why is there some sort of problem making the same strategy go through in dimension three? So here's the problem, and here's why new techniques were needed. So problem, if two cylinders are parallel at some point in an orbit closure, this is for dimension three, very important. And this was shown by Alex Ray. Let me prove something more general. They are generically parallel. In other words, this phenomenon can't happen. We have four cylinders here, all of which are parallel. Then we perturb our surface slightly, and two of them cease to be parallel to the other two. When you have dimension three, that can't happen. These four cylinders at all other points are going to remain parallel to each other. So fundamentally, this idea of using cylinder parallelism to build your branch cover, it isn't going to work unless you're building a branch cover of a torus. So you need some sort of new idea. The old idea just is not strong enough. OK, so that is the theorem. That's the sketch in high dimension. And so now we seem like a problem why the old strategy can't work, so it's time to see what will work. Or Paul? Yeah, you too. Did yeah. you just prove this? That, that, that what's the, the connection with the dim dimension? Yeah, uh, yeah. Sorry? No, no, so I didn't prove this. This is something that Alex. Well, this is, this, are we remembering this from your previous yeah. talk? Or? No, this, so this right here is, this is, remember, from previous work. Yeah. yeah. This here is something that Alex proved. Uh, sorry, proved. And with the three, dimension three. With dimension three. The real yeah. condition yeah. is rank one, but I didn't want to introduce the idea of rank. And just to understand, yep. you're dealing with a d minus one, d minus one strata because we need some rel. Exactly. Yes, we are. And we are dealing with rank one orbit closures of all exactly. three, four. Mm -hmm. Yes, we're dealing with rank, rank one in H d minus one, d minus one. Yeah, exactly. So, so you might actually clarify things a little bit if you know the notion of rank already. Right. I mean, yeah, you're, you're trying to make it simple for us if we right. don't know the notion. Exactly. I don't want to define rank and rel. If you do know the notion of rank and rel, then sort of this works with high rank. We need a low rank or rather rank one method. And that's the new thing here. Okay. So that's the problem. So what's the solution going to be? 
So we need a new way of teasing out what cylinder should go to the same thing. So I'll make two definitions. So one, we'll say a collection of numbers is Q-related, non-zero numbers, let's say, if all ratios of two numbers in this collection belong to Q. And then we'll say two parallel cylinders, we'll say, are sub-equivalent if they have generically Q-related moduli. Okay? So two cylinders, they're parallel, and if their ratio of moduli is always rational at all nearby surfaces, we'll say that they are sub-equivalent to each other. This is going to be our new replacement notion for parallelism. And this notion will allow us to build a branch cover. So let's see what's going on. What is yeah, go ahead. nearby? What is nearby? Do you mean in the SL2? Yeah, yeah. So I mean in the SL2 orbit closure. Generic for me always means generic inside uh, some sort of affine and brain something. What's your reason? If they have what? If all the ratios are inside of Q. No, the the next uh, Oh, sorry. If they are, yeah, I should have written that out. Generically. Generic. Q related. Yep. Okay. So, why is this the definition that we decided to make? Well, if the theorem. Sorry, is there another question? Yeah. Two parallel cylinders. Yeah, okay. Definition's a mess. Okay. Two parallel cylinders are subequivalent if they have generically Q related branch Yes. Alright. So, why is this a good definition? Well, if the theorem is true, then here's what we expect. If I take some sort of surface, so uh, yeah. inside of M, then what I'm expecting, what I'm anticipating, is that this is going to be the cover of something living inside of H1. Okay, this cylinder here has two preimages, this cylinder here has two preimages, and this cylinder here has this one preimage. And if you're in the preimage of a given cylinder, then you not only are always parallel to everything else that's in the preimage of that cylinder, but you and all your friends have generically cumulated much of So even if we don't have parallelism, cylinder parallelism, building these branch covers for us, we might hope that this notion of subequivalence is strong enough to build these branch covers. Okay, so this is sort of what I have in mind and why I've made this definition. And so there are two things that we hope. Can you explain again why do you expect to relate to these modules? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you map down to the same cylinder downstream, right, then what does your cylinder look like? Your cylinder looks, maybe it's a direct copy of the thing downstairs, maybe it's two of those cylinders glued together. Whatever it is, it's going to have rationally related so you're searching for loci which come from branching, and this is supposed to detect. Exactly, yeah. And so we really expect two things. So if the theorem holds true, we expect two things. So Martin had a wish list, I think, of three things yesterday in his talk. I'll make two wishes. So wish list, wish number one is that subequivalent cylinders have identical heights. And wish number two is that there are at most three subequivalence classes. Okay? If we're covers of H11, then that's definitely going to be true. And in fact, so by the techniques in the dimension bigger than 3 case, A plus B would imply that. Okay. So how do we build branch covers? Well, we use the same techniques we did before with cylinder parallelism, 
We'll replace cylinder parallelism with this new notion of subequivalence, and if we can prove these two facts, then we're done just by before. Okay. So that's the name of the game. Questions about that before moving on? Okay. All right, so I want to now sketch why A and B are true. Because they're true for a very simple reason, and this is what I was sort of highlighting at the top. They're true for a simple reason which should apply to other strata. It doesn't use a lot. So, what's a proof of A and B? So here's what we're going to do. All of these proofs are going to start exactly the same way, which is that by Smiley Weiss, we can find some sort of let's say, horizontally periodic translation surface living inside of it. Okay? So we use horizontal flow, and what do we produce? We produce something maybe that looks like that. Okay? And now here's something that I want to mention. I want to draw it in a picture before I say it in words, which is that if I end up it's some sort of translation surface like this. It's horizontally periodic. That's great. But I'm very dissatisfied because I know that this translation surface could have three cylinders, and it doesn't. But nearby, there is a translation surface that has three cylinders. If I just bump this very slightly, if I perturb, then I can find, for instance, this translation surface Okay, great thing about that translation surface, it has more cylinders, and on top of that, this lives inside of H11, and the relative deformation on H11, the one that preserves all absolute periods, is incredibly simple here. The relative deformation is just increase this cylinder by T, subtract T off from the height of that cylinder, that keeps that period fixed. How do I keep that period fixed? Well, I increase the cylinder by T. <coughs> These cylinders are arranged in some sort of tree. The relative deformation is just alternate plus t minus t along my tree. It's very simple. And so this perturbation that I want to do by cylinder deformation theorem, I write, can always be done. We can always, in this case, perturb to a new surface with one, all old cylinders parallel and present, the maximum number of cylinders, and the relative deformation given by some sort of alternating plus minus uh, change of heights. Mm -hmm. All right, so I took my initial surface. I didn't like it, so now I'm changing it to. Wait, I'm thinking about the relative, you should do two-dimensional, two-way relations to the So T is yeah. a complex number, or what? Uh, yeah, you can say T is a complex number. I want a relative deformation, which is going to keep these cylinders parallel. But yeah, you can do two things. For instance, you could shear this by T, this by minus T, and that by T. That's one of your real uh, dimensions. The other real dimension is you increase this by t, squeeze that down by t, increase that by t. That's your second dimension. Make sense? All right. So now I have a whole bunch of cylinders. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to just use these cylinders, and linear flow on a torus, to try to see what sort of deformations we can get. OK, so I'm going to take something periodic like this, and now we're going to apply a shear, okay? So what happens, sorry, right. so what happens to the case cylinder when we apply the shear? Cylinder CK, and we'll think of it as some cylinder in that picture of height YK, like XK, is being Shared by this at speed 
TYK. The taller you are, the faster some sort of point on the top of your cylinder is moving to the right. Okay. And what happens? Well, we can only shear so much because at the end you do some sort of Dane twist. And so we're being sheared at speed TYK, but in the end we, have, we do some Dane twist and get back to where we start. So this is mod XK. Whenever I have sheared uh, like XK, I've done one Dane twist, I'm back to where I began. Okay, so if we look at this shearing system, what is it? Cylinder 1 is being sheared at speed T Y1, mod X1, and the final cylinder being sheared at this speed. Okay, so what is this? This is T M1 to Mn mod 1, where Mk is the modulus of the cylinder, it's Yk over Xk. Okay, so you shear, and because everything is periodic, what you get is some sort of, when you look at your shearing system, you get some sort of linear flow on a torus. And so you know exactly what this orbit closure is going to be, and so you can work out what sort of deformations you get just by applying 1t, 0, 1. And so the answer is the following. So here's a summary of what we've said. It's let W be the collection of rational linear relations, uh, which are satisfied by M. And then if V, uh, some vector, so V1 to V M, is in W perp, then we see that we have some sort of tangent vector, 2R to M, which is the following, then xk, dk, and k prime is tangent to m, where gamma k is the core curve, core curve of the case. OK. So this is a picture we know well. It's we take some sort of horizontally periodic translation surface. We shear linear flow on the torus tells us then what sort of deformations we expect to see. Okay. So now, maybe I'll make one more remark. Because we're in dimension 3, we know exactly what should be in W perp. So W perp is the span of M and also this vector minus 1 to the di over xi. All right, this observation is sort of the key that allows you to prove these results A and B that you want. Okay? Somehow everything comes down to this simple observation about linear flow in a torus. All right, and so now we're ready to prove results A and B just from these observations here. And also to see why this talk is called shouting across the board. So, we start with our surface produced by Smiley Weiss plus this application of rope. Yeah. Sorry, can you repeat A? Yeah. So we expect subequivalent cylinders to have the same heights. Any oh. two of them should have the same height. Okay. All right, so here's our horizontally periodic surface that we started with. And now we're going to do sort of the only thing we can, which is apply rel. So that's minus t here, this cylinder gets t bigger, that's t shorter, this cylinder gets t bigger. So as we apply that in time, what happens? Well, we'll say that cylinder is the smallest, it collapses first. We get some sort of picture like this, and I'll call this the void, for reasons to be clear in a second. And then we continue collapsing, we over collapse, we get some sort of picture like this. Okay, so why do I call this the void? I call this the void because even though there are cylinders, let's make it clear, 
So can you explain again what the deformation of a U collapse? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We apply a rel deformation. Yes. When you're a three-dimensional orbit closure, you have rel. The structure of rel is exactly this. Your cylinders are arranged in a tree. You make this guy a little bit bigger, this smaller, bigger, smaller, etc. You get down to this point, and then you keep going. Rel, flowing along rel is a linear flow and a linear manifold. And we haven't run into the boundary here. So we can keep flowing along our straight line, and our cylinders over collapse now to this picture here. Let me ask a question. Yeah. You seem to be assuming, or somehow, that uh, whenever you have these two adjacent cylinders, uh, yeah. there's a there's an exit through the two of them, right? Yes, that is true. That's a fact of height. That's, that's why you get this minus two points. Exactly. Yep, exactly. And shouldn't, shouldn't the right hand side of the surface also have some deformation? I mean, the, the zero reappears somewhere else, should it? Yeah, I mean, yeah, the yeah. picture is the picture that the, you're drawing only correct on the left hand side, on the right hand side of the picture, something else should as well be happening. Yeah, let, let's say that these get smaller. But uh, maybe, I'm just drawing one example, nothing collapses. Which apostrophe is not true right. by what you're proving because they all have the same height, but yes. for the moment we don't know that. Yet. Exactly, yes. Okay, so we do this collapse. Wait, so could you, wait, yes. there's the two uh, dots in the middle picture? Uh, <laughs> yep, that's right. Did you show where, this, where they come from in the previous picture? Yeah, that's sure. The, the one up top is to that part right there. And the one on the bottom. Uh, this is glued here, so it's that image. Great, right, thank you very much. Yeah, it's, it's not the little corner. Yeah, Sorry. and so this should be that. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, no problem. So, cylinders persist, but the relations on the moduli between them do not persist from this side of the picture to this side. The void swallows them up. What we knew to be true over here no longer has to be true over here. And so we need some way of transmitting information from one side of the void to the other. We want to shout across the void. Okay. And so here's what we're going to do. We're going to say, let A not be the cylinders that disappear. They get eaten by the void. Here, that's only one. One was the only cylinder that disappeared. We have cylinders that remain and have the same rel coefficient. So what do I mean? When we keep flowing along rel, we get this new cylinder that appears. And as we flow, this cylinder gets bigger as we continue our rel deformation. So we get a plus t here. Cylinder 2, because it's being collapsed in 2, gets smaller. And cylinder 3 and 4 continue doing whatever they did before. 3 gets smaller, 4 continues to expand. So in this collection, we have cylinders that remain on the other side of the void. And either they keep shrinking, like 3, or they keep getting bigger, like 4. And so finally what we have are cylinders that remain, but with different <coughs> coefficients. And the only example of that is two. Okay? You're and so. You're saying cylinders that remain, but isn't it just that the label you're saying? It's not the same cylinder. I mean, if you think that these are cylinders. The same yeah, it, so, so <coughs> locally, as long as your cylinder doesn't have its area greater than zero. You can identify one cylinder with a cylinder in a nearby surface, as long as it hasn't disappeared. So along this line, we have a consistent identification of two with this cylinder, and of three with that cylinder, etc. Okay? And so the upshot of all of this is that, where did I put it? Here we go. We have that W prime is spanned by M and something which only depends on lights. In particular, the collection of rational relations that the moduli of our cylinder satisfy is going to be exactly given up to multiplication by some matrix of zeros and plus minus ones. It's going to be given 
But I have a perp. What did you get? The di. What are they? Yeah, it's distance in this cylinder graph. It ah. basically is whether this coefficient is plus or minus one. Yeah, no problem. What this relation says, and I'll wrap up, is that all of your relations on moduli can be determined exactly by your uh, by the lengths. And so in particular, because we know that some cylinders have persisted across the void, we actually can work out, we can throw relationships on moduli from this side of the void to the other side of the void, because all of the relations that the moduli satisfy, at least on this collection of cylinders, the ones that persist, are going to be realized as the relations that are satisfied by one over the reciprocal of these cylinder lengths. And so that mechanism gives us a way of throwing information from this picture to this picture. And the upshot after all of this is going to be the following, which it's a, it's a short derivation, but I don't have time for it, which is that these collections are exactly sub-equivalence classes. And heights of cylinders in A naught, A minus, and A plus are constant. In other words, by seeing what cylinders disappear, what cylinders remain with the same sort of coefficient in rel, and what cylinders remain but with a change coefficient in rel, you've identified exactly the three subequivalence classes that you wanted, and you can show from short derivation that the heights of these cylinders are the same. That's all you needed to show that what you had by this was a branch covering construction. And so the sort of amazing thing about this proof is that you don't need almost anything about height. Really, you just need this sort of argument right here. And if you have a way of understanding rel on all surfaces, you can run this argument, and you can derive a similar sort of consequence. So that's all I have time for, so thank you for your attention. Confused about the summary and the dimensions of W and W perb and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, yeah, N yeah. for the moment is arbitrary, right? I mean, we don't know what N. Q to the N. W lives in Q to the N. Yes, right. This is, N should really be G plus one. I should have written G plus one. It's these are rational relations that the moduli and the cylinder satisfy. Why is it G plus one? I mean, for the no, moment we don't know how many cylinders we have, do we? No, in height you do. That's one of the special things about hype. Ah, you're using that. Okay. Yep. So the two things you use about hype, one, that you had these G plus one cylinders, two, you know exactly what rel is. If you had a similar understanding for other strata, you could run this argument. It works in hype because we know exactly how many cylinders there are and what rel looks like. Okay, so W is a G dimensional Q vector space. Uh, yes, right. Yep. And it's also given not just as the rational relations that M satisfies, but morally, up to some sort of trivial matrix, the rational relations that one of those of life satisfies. And that sort of dual life is what lets you throw information about moduli across this void. And then W perp is a, a, a one-dimensional matrix. Two-dimensional. Why? Uh -huh. It should be satisfied both. It should be the things. I mean. Uh, sorry. W perp then should be a G minus two dimensional, sorry, a G minus one dimensional vector space. It should be co-dimension two. If all of your moduli were rationally related, right, you still have freedom to scale them. So you're not going to, W perp will never be full dimensional. If it were full dimensional, then these moduli would be pinned down to specific rational numbers. Yes. So even if all the moduli were rationally related, the maximally constrained situation, <coughs> this is going to be co-dimension one because you still have the freedom to scale them. When you additionally have this rel deformation, it's code mentioned to you. Okay. Yeah? Where do you use that in your non genus 2? Yeah. So you use your non genus 2 when you say, so here's what you say. You have three subequivalence classes. And so what that does, it's kind of hidden <coughs> in this remark here, is it builds you a map to a surface in H1. 
So you're not in genus 2 because the map that you would get then is just the identity map and you don't know anything about multiple closure. So what do you expect to become of these wishes in D for other strata? Yeah, so I don't, like Martin, don't want to speculate on camera. <laughs> so, so I'll remain agnostic. <laughs>